Will you praise the Lord again for all that God's doing in people's lives at West Florida Baptist Church? I knew today would be an emotional day on many levels. My wife's been crying all week long. Every time we talk about uh, the anniversary in the church and what God's been doing here, um, I didn't quite anticipate my heart feeling like it's about to beat out of my chest like it is just as we went through the singing and the worship and then just seeing those testimonies. And I have to tell you, on Friday morning, um, I pulled onto the campus here and I parked right out front and I parked just facing the funeral home over there and I could not get out of the car. I just sat there and just took a few minutes just reflecting on who God is, just praising God. I was, I was excited about the message. I had been studying that morning at home a little bit and just knew where we were going with that. And then I pulled onto the property and I was thinking about Garrett and I was thinking about Daniel and Audra and I was thinking about Wendy and their testimonies and just I had watched those videos and I got to see a lot more of the raw footage than even that and was just overwhelmed by what God's doing in lives. And then I started thinking about the 15 people that are going to get baptized this afternoon. Will you praise the Lord for that? 15 people. And the way God's saving and the way God's transforming. And I was thinking about really the, the almost even the unexpected. There's five new families that are joining the church today um, in the middle of the summer, in the middle of all the craziness of people in and out. And God's still moving and working. And I just... I was just overwhelmed just praising God and thanking him for the privilege of being able to serve him and essentially just you're worthy of it all. That's exactly what I was saying in my heart. And as soon as I, I got done praying and just giving God the praise, I opened up my eyes and I turned my head just over to the right. And you know what I saw? I saw the cemetery and I saw the graves and it just hit me full force. I was like, wow, God, what an unbelievable reminder. I'm sitting in a parking lot of a place. And I know it's a building and it's a place. We are the church, but this is a place. This is a body of believers that lifts high the name of Jesus. This is a piece of property that points people to the life that can only be found in Jesus Christ. And what a life it is. What an abundant life. It's an everlasting life. It's an eternal life. It's a life that will change everything about your life and the way that you're living. And right next door, it's a stark contrast to that, a reminder. It's a cemetery. It's a graveyard. And what a reality of what life is all about. In just a moment, our lives can be taken from us. And there is an eternity that is at stake. And I said, God, help burn that fire deep inside of my heart. Help burn that fire deep inside the church where we never forget why we exist and why we are here and what our purpose is and what our mission is as a church. And can I tell you this morning, I love anniversary Sundays. I love days like this. Because not only do we get to give God all the glory and praise, we get to be reminded of why we are here and why we exist in the first place. God put us on this earth. I love the fact you hear a lot about loving God and loving others. We exist to bring glory to God. And we glorify God when we love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. When we love our neighbors as ourselves. But if you are truly loving God and loving others, do you know what you're going to have? You're going to live on mission. You're going to have a burning passion and a desire to see people believe in the transforming power of Jesus Christ. You're going to have a passion for people to belong to his church. You're going to have a passion for people to become everything that God wants them to be. These aren't just words on a shirt. This is the message and the heartbeat and the passion of God's word. And it ought to be the message and the heartbeat and the passion of his church. And that leads us to our message this morning. The title of my message this morning is this, A Father, a Dead Dog, and a King. How many of you like a really good story? Anybody like good stories here? I love a good story. I especially love a really good Bible story. And the, a father, a dead dog, and a king, they are the main characters in the story that we're going to be looking at this morning. And each one of them gives us an incredible believe belong and become lesson that needs to be learned and that needs to be applied to our lives. So that's it for my introduction. We're just going to dive right in and we're going to let the story speak for itself. Okay, so we're going to start this morning with a father. Let's talk about a father that we find here in this passage. Second Samuel chapter 9. Are you all still there? Everybody still Second Samuel chapter 9? Okay, look at verse 1 with me and follow along. I'm going to have you help me out here at the end. It says this, and David said, 
is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for everybody out loud for Jonathan's sake? Before we move any further, we have to identify and talk about who is Jonathan. I'm glad you asked me this morning. Let me tell you about Jonathan. Jonathan is Saul's oldest son. Saul was the king of Israel before David was the king of Israel, which if you're following along with me, uh, Jonathan's the oldest son. That puts him in line to be the next king of Israel. The problem for Jonathan, he was never going to be the king. God had already anointed David to be the next king of Israel because Jonathan's father, Saul, was disobedient to God and he messed up. And because of that, God said, you could have had the kingdom forever, but I'm going to take it away from you and I'm going to give it to another person. So Jonathan never had a chance. And sure enough, 15 years earlier, before we even make it to where we're at here in 2 Samuel chapter 9, Jonathan and his father Saul and two of his brothers went out to fight the Philistines at the battle of Mount Gilboa. And guess what happened? All of them died and they were killed. Now, fast forward to where we're at here in 2 Samuel chapter 9. We are 15 years after the death of Saul and Jonathan, after the regime change. And chapter 8, verse 15, we're not going to turn there. But right at the end of chapter 8, right before we get to chapter 9, you find a very important phrase. It says, and David reigned over all Israel. I'm not going to take the time to go into all those details, but there was a regime change. You went from one dynasty of a family to another dynasty of a family. How many of you agree when you look at history, regime changes can be pretty messy and complicated and take a little bit of time? Sure enough, that's how it was in the nation of Israel. It took a while for David to unite the kingdom of Israel. It took a while for David to settle some of the outside enemies. And finally, here he is about 15 years after he becomes king of Israel. There's finally enough peace in the land for him to turn his attention to other places. And where does he decide to turn his attention? He says, is there anybody left of the house of Saul that I can show him kindness? For Jonathan's sake. And I'm like, are you kidding me? How many of you think that'd be one of the first things you'd want to turn your attention to? Showing kindness to your arch enemy in life. That's what's happening and that's what's taking place here. All right, so let's continue with the story. Look at verses 2 and 3. It says this. And there was at the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame on his feet. Jonathan hath yet a son. Jonathan is the father in our story. And he had a son, and his son was lame on his feet. And his son was lame on his feet because of his father. Now listen to this. Because of his father, he was considered an enemy. And 15 years earlier, when news got back to Mephibosheth's house, that's who we're going to find out his son's name is in just a little bit. When news got back to his house that his father and his grandfather and his uncles were dead, he's next in line to be the king. His nurse decides that she needs to take immediate action and she needs to flee and she needs to hide him to keep him alive because he's now all of a sudden an enemy. And as they're escaping, a horrible accident happens. And, and as a result, Mephibosheth is lame on both of his feet. So for the past 15 years of his life, every single time he got in that wheelchair, you know what he thought about? I'm the enemy of the king. I have to hide from David. For 15 years of his life, every single day he was reminded that he was in the position of an enemy. And all of a sudden in our passage, David's looking for him. How many of you think you'd be really excited about that? Oh, finally, David, he's coming to look for me. How many of you think fear would run through every fiber of your being? I mean, that, that, you got to put yourself here in this story, okay? So let's read on. Let's look at what it says here in verses 4 and, and on down. It says, And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he's in the house of Maker, the son of Emil, in Lodabar. Then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Makar, the son of Emil, from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold thy servant. Verse 7, And David said unto him, Fear not. Wow, those must have been the most, the best words that he ever heard in his entire life. <laughs> Fear 
not. And then he says, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan, thy father's sake. Because of his father, he was considered to be an enemy. But because of his father, he wasn't David's enemy. He was David's friend. You have to understand, Jonathan and David had the most famous friendship in all of the Bible. And for very good reason. I could tell you a lot of stories about their relationship. I'll tell you just one. There was a point in life where Saul's jealousy of David took over. And David had to run and flee for years. And he's hiding. And there was a point in his life where there was nowhere for him to escape. Everywhere he hid. People were reporting him back to the king and were reporting his location. So he's on the move. He's hiding in the wilderness of Ziph. And guess who shows up to encourage him? None other than Jonathan. Now, if I was Jonathan, now, I don't know. I don't want to put myself in that position. This is going to sound bad. But if you study human history, okay, if you study human history, and you're in the position of Jonathan, and David is going to be your successor to take the throne, what do you think is going to happen? Maybe he's going to like stab him in the back, poison him, something like that. But listen to what Jonathan said to David in 1 Samuel. And he said unto him, Fear not, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find thee, and thou shalt be king over Israel, and I shall be next unto thee, and that also Saul my father knoweth. Are you kidding me? He knows that David's going to be the next king. He knows that he's anointed by God, and it doesn't matter to him. He just wants God's will to be done, and he loves his friend, and he doesn't care about himself. He cares more about David, and as a result of that, he says, so be it. I'm here to help you, and I'm here to support you, and I'll serve by your side. Jonathan was unique in every single way. David should have been his enemy, but he was his friend. His love for David is a picture of the unconditional, self-sacrificing love of God. And the only thing that he ever asked of David was that David would show kindness to his seed forever. And here he is 15 years later, and he's repaying the favor. Are you ready for the practical application? What does believe have to do with all of this? Here's the practical application. Believe, accept, regard as true the Father's Love changes everything. How many of you would agree that the Father's love changes everything? You know, the Bible is incredible because everything about the Bible points back to Jesus Christ and it points back to the story of God the Father. And guess what? Because of the Father, we are his enemy. The Bible tells us that God is the creator of heaven and earth. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. And he is holy and he is righteous and he is good and perfect in all his ways. And sin cannot enter into his presence. And one day we're going to die and we're going to stand in the very presence of God. And we're going to stand, if we stand in our sin, as an enemy of God. And there's nothing that we can do about it. Because of the Father, we are his enemy. But because of the Father... We are his friends. Because of the Father, we are his friends. How many of you know John 3.16? Who knows John 3.16? How about y'all help me out? Let's say that out loud together. What is, it? What is John 3.16? My mind just went blank. Here we go. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do you understand the treasure that's in a verse like that. God the Father loved us even though we're rebels against him. And he loved us enough that even though we couldn't do anything about our sin, he could and he sent his son Jesus Christ who went to a cross and who died in our place. And if we believe on him, we can have eternal life and our life can be changed. West Florida Baptist Church, I wanna challenge us today to never lose sight of the fact that there are people in this world who need to believe that the Father's love changes everything. There's more people like Garrett Garrett's testimony, man, that night, I'll never forget that night when we sat down with Garrett and his wife, and we're in there, and uh, he, he even said in there, he didn't really want to come to that meeting, and then he's like, I'm not telling this guy anything, and then we sat down, and he just starts crying and spilling the beans. I mean, it was just like, dumps everything right there on the spot. I'm calling him out and embarrassing him right now, but man alive, I'll tell you what, the truth of God's word has the power to change lives. And our job is just to lift high the name of Jesus and to keep pointing to Jesus. And we never know what he's doing and how he's moving and how he's working. But we know this, that the Father's love changes everything. And we have an incredible message that the world needs to hear. Can I get an amen right there? Y'all need to get excited this morning, okay? 
This is a celebration service. All right. Secondly, we're going to talk about a dead dog. Y'all want to, are y'all interested in hearing about a dead dog? No, some of you are like, no, not a dead dog. That's just a sad thing. All right, listen. Mephibosheth, he's the dead dog. Mephibosheth is a mess. He was a complete mess. I'm not going to go back and read those verses that we just went through, but they emphasize the fact that he was living in Lodabar. You know what that word Lodabar means? It means a place of no pasture. For 15 years of his life, he was living in the desert. He was living in a wasteland. He was living in a forgotten place. And guess what? He felt every day of his life that he was a forgotten person. On top of that, in verse 3, it says that he was lame on both his feet. That word for lame in verse 3 is a really powerful word. It means smitten or stricken. But it literally means maimed. But it has a deeper meaning. It figuratively means that he's dejected. It's not just talking about his physical pain and his physical anguish. It's also talking about the fact that he was experiencing extreme mental anguish and extreme mental shame. This guy's full of dejection. He's full of anguish. He's broken. Verse 8 gives us a really good look at his uh, mental condition. Look at verse 8. It says, And he bowed himself. And said, what is thy servant that thou shouldest? You all help me out. Read the end of this verse. Look upon such a dead dog as I am. Right there, man, you just get a glimpse into what's been taking place in his mind for the past 15 years. He was living like a dead dog. He was an outcast. Everything was taken from him. And on top of that, He was lame on both his feet. He couldn't escape it. He couldn't escape his shame. He couldn't escape his dejection. He couldn't escape how bad life had been to him. Every single day of his life, that's where he's living his life. And he's dejected and he's suffering and he's broken. And then suddenly, just like that, in an instant, everything changes. The king sends for him. He shows up to the king's house. He has no idea what he's going to expect. Look back at verse 7 with me. Y'all got to see this. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake. And then everybody help me read the last part of that verse. And will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. It would have been nice enough for him to get an official pardon and say, you can move back into Israel. But that's not, that's not what David did. David gave him back all of his grandfather's land. David gave him servants. David poured out an unbelievable amount of mercy and grace in Mephibosheth's life. And everything got turned upside down. Here's the practical application. Belong. A belong. Belong. Be in the right place. How many of you think the king's table is a pretty good place to be? (laughs) How many of you would rather be at the king's table than lost in the wilderness of Lodabar somewhere? I mean, he's in the right place. Here's the lesson about belonging. A dead dog can be royalty. A dead dog can be royalty. I don't believe that his name is Mephibosheth by accident. You know what that name Mephibosheth means? It means shame destroyer or image breaker. We just got done singing about how God takes graves and he turns them into gardens. Hey, look down at verse 13. You got to see this too, man. The, this book is alive. There's so many awesome things. Look at verse 13 with me. It says, So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table, And was, everybody read the end of that verse with me, help me out, lame on both his feet. You might be sitting there saying, I thought you said something was exciting here. I already know that he's lame on both his feet. We've been talking about it. What you don't know is that that word lame in verse 13 is the same in English as it is in verse 3, but they're not the same words in Hebrew. In Hebrew, in verse 3, that word lame had to do with the idea of the, the physical. He was physically lame, but also the mental anguish. And here in verse 13, it's just a word that simply means lame. That's it. He's now just lame. Do you see what happened? Because 
of the love of a father. Because the father's love changes everything. And because of the unmerited favor of the king, he found himself in a position where his fortunes completely changed. And there was a reversal. And now he's sitting at the king's table. And now he has land. And now he has houses. And now his mental anguish is gone. And his dejection and his shame has been destroyed. And he's sitting at the king's table. And he's just lame. Doesn't even matter anymore that he's lame because everything else about his life is fixed and back on the right track. That deserves a bigger amen than that. <laughs> These are not my words, this is God's word. And I hope you're under making the connection here. Belong. West Florida Baptist Church, be in the right place. Do you understand this morning that we were all dead dogs, all of us? That's you and I. This is a picture of us. We are sinners. We are broken. Everybody's story. Everybody's story includes brokenness. Everybody's story includes shame. And there's nothing like the excitement when all of a sudden Jesus enters the story and it gets turned upside down. We were dead dogs, but now we are royalty. You know what the church says? You know what's so awesome about belonging to the church? The church says that following Christ isn't as crazy as you thought it would be. I think probably, I'm going to speak for Garrett here, probably he had a little bit of hesitation because maybe he thought some Christians were a little bit crazy at times. But then he started coming and God started working in his heart and everything's changed. I think of Daniel and Audra. Man, Daniel was chasing a dream job, something that he said was even an idol in his life. You wanted to be a naval aviator. I think naval aviators are pretty awesome people. I mean, you want to talk about a level of cool, like that's next level cool right there. And he's pursuing that. But all of a sudden, they start, they start coming to church. And more importantly than church, God's word starts working in their hearts and their lives. And everything changes. Their priorities change. The way they look at life changes. What you didn't get to hear in that video was the fact that they love having their son sitting with them in church. And there's no other place that they'd rather be than raising their children and building their lives and building their family around what God's doing in and through his church. That's what belonging is all about. You want another awesome testimony that gets me fired up? Dan Libby, Pastor Dan, you didn't see him today. We missed him up here on stage. Dan's up here every week. Man, that guy is full of joy, praising the Lord nonstop. You know what Dan's doing right now? Actually, Lisa, is he on a flight right now? <laughs> Lisa has no clue. He's not around and she's happy. No, just kidding. <laughs> Dan, at some point today, is going to be flying from London, England to uh, Delhi, I believe, in India. I think that's where they're landing. And then he's going to be getting on another plane, and he's going to be flying to Manipur, and he's going to be going to India, to the place where we gave all that money to the India Project. And over the course of this next week, Dan is going to be teaching, preaching a couple of times, teaching 10 lessons to men who are being trained in the gospel of Jesus Christ, who are going to take the gospel to closed countries that, that we couldn't ever get to for God's honor and for God's glory. And you know why I get so fired up about that? You want to talk about a dead dog? Dan was a dead dog. And he would tell you that himself if he was here. I get fired up every time. I th and I, Yesterday, man, he's in London and he's living his best life. They had a little bit of a layover they weren't expecting. He's at the palace. He's walking all around the streets. He's not sleeping. He's living it up. And I'm sitting there saying, praise God. Praise God. That's what God will do. When he showed up at our church, he was a drunk. Their marriage was falling apart. But God, he turned it all upside down, and he took a dead dog, and he made him royalty. And you think it's crazy? Hey, look no further than a person like Dan, who's living his dream life, who's doing exceeding abundantly above anything that you could ever ask or think, and that story can be repeated over and over and over again. I'm telling you, belong. Belong to the right place and get involved in a church and watch God drastically turn things upside down for his honor and for his glory. And by the way, there's plenty of room at the table for more. And that's why our desire is for more people like Dan and more people like Gary and more people like the 15 people that are following Jesus in baptism today. There is room, plenty of room at the king's table. Last but not least, and we're done. A king. So we talked about the father. We talked about a dead dog, a king. David is a picture of what the child of God should be. David represents what you and I should be. We go from dead dogs, we go to royalty. Look at verse 3 one more time with me in 2 Samuel chapter 8. Look at verse 3. Sorry, 9. It says, 
And the king said, is there not yet any of the house of Saul? Everybody read that next line with me. That I may show the kindness of God unto him. That I may show the kindness of God unto him. This whole passage is about David taking all that God had blessed him with and showing the kindness of God to somebody else. Verses 9 through 12 give all the details about how he did that. I'm not going to read them, but he gave him back all Saul's land. And he gave him Saul's servants. He gave him Ziba and his family. And you might think, that's not that big of a deal. Ziba had 15 sons, and they had 20 servants. That's 35 people at his disposal to do the work for him right there. I mean, that's incredible. David lavished out the blessings of God become to grow, to change and transform. Do you think David ever imagined as a shepherd boy taking care of his father's sheep that one day he would be king of Israel? You think he was out there just sitting there thinking, man, I can't wait till someday I'm king. That thought never even entered his mind. It didn't even enter his parents' mind. That was the most foreign thing in his life. Do you think that he imagined while he was running for Saul, scared for his life, that someday he would give all of Saul's land back to somebody in Saul's family? Do you think that thought ever crossed his mind? Hey, <laughs> do you think that he imagined being the king of Israel and that his position as king would be a representation of the king of kings and the Lord of lords? Could you have ever imagined David thinking that one day the Son of God, Jesus Christ, would come through his line and through his lineage. And I say to you, there's no way David could have ever dreamed or imagined all that God was going to do. And I got to tell you this morning, God has bigger and better plans for your life than you can ever imagine. So become. Become an extension of Christ. That's what David was. That's, that's what the story is about. We are the hands and feet of Jesus. It's our job to take all that he's blessed us with and to use it to bless others and to share and to show the kindness of God to a world that's in need of it. And to West Florida Baptist Church, the last challenge I got to give us today is change the temperature. Change the temperature. Miss Bacon actually sent me an Instagram reel the other night, and it had this illustration in it. And I said, I don't care. I'm stealing it, and I'm using it. And I didn't think it was going to work out for today, but it is going to work out for today. Does anybody know what I have in my hand right here? thermostat. That's it right. It's a thermostat. Here's a challenge. Don't be a thermometer. Don't be a thermometer. There's a major difference between a thermometer and a thermostat. You know what a thermometer does? A thermometer is just a reflection of the room. It just exists and it tells you if it's 64.2 degrees in here. How many of you are freezing this morning? Sometimes you can't ever get the air right in a church. Sometimes it's People think it's cold. Some people think it's hot. We do our best, okay? But all a thermometer does is tell you what the temperature of a room is. Don't be a thermometer, especially as a child of God. You know what? We have way too many Christians who all they are is a reflection of the world that they live in. That's it. We just blend right in, and whatever the temperature of the world is, that's what temperature we are. If the world's pursuing their dreams and their idols and their careers and their plans and their jobs and their vacations, so many people, yeah, they have Christ and they claim to know Christ, but they live and look no differently than the rest of the world around them. Don't be a thermometer. Be a thermostat. You know what's awesome about this thing right here? This thing right here has the power to change the temperature of the room. In and of itself, this is, just an, this is actually a broken thermostat right here, but I know someone could fix it up. This is just an old one, but you know what? You fix this thing up and you plug it into the right power source. You plug it into the right power source. Remember last week? You are full of goodness. You are filled with all knowledge because you're filled with the Holy Spirit of God. You are plugged in to a power source. And you know what God's done? He's left us here in this world as an extension of Christ to be his hands and feet, to go out into the world and to change the temperature and to make a difference. That's what David did in Mephibosheth's life. He changed the temperature. He lavished out the grace and the love of God, and it changed everything about him. And God wants us to do the same thing. Hey, I'm sure just like many of you in here, last night we're sitting there eating dinner and Shepard's like, President Trump just got shot at. And I was like, no way. So I go open up my app and sure enough, so we turn on the news and for like the next hour and a half, I'm just sitting there and I'm watching history 
take place in front of us. Can I tell you this morning, President Trump, President Biden, they are not the answer for this country. Can I tell you this morning that even if the rhetoric gets toned down, which God help us, it needs to get toned down. Even if the rhetoric gets turned down, that's not enough to change the temperature of the, de- of the direction that our country is headed in. The only thing that's going to change the temperature, the only thing that's going to make a difference is the name of Jesus and his transforming power. And it's our job to not get sidetracked by these other things. Yes, get involved. Yes, pray. Yes, be a good citizen. Yes, do all of those things. But never lose sight of the fact that we have a greater name and a greater reason to live for. And his name is Jesus. And when we get a hold of who he is, and what he's done for his life, and we go out and we share that and we proclaim it, oh yeah, we can change the temperature of your city, of your work, of your neighborhood, of someone in your family's life, one person at a time, and then we get to be a part of sending someone like Pastor Dan to India, who's going to hopefully change the temperature of men that are going to go out to close countries. For Do you understand what it is that we get to be a part of? Become everything that Christ wants you to be. We are extensions of his love. Believe in his transforming power. Belong to his church. Become everything he's created you to be.